nine, successfully with teacher certificate B in 1950. He later went to Peking Teacher Training College from 1954 to 1956 and obtained teacher training certificate A. Very Reverend Amenyedu's teaching career spanned over 25 years from 1951 to 1977. His first station as a professional teacher was at TRV in the Volta region. He taught at several other places, including Kita, Anyako, Chiame, Abo, Aflao, and We. He was promoted to the rank of a head teacher at EP Primary School, Anyako. In 1966, at the invitation of C.K. Nyomi, who was the principal of Mkranza Training College in the Bronx Ahafo, he went to teach Ewe in the Department of Languages at the institution. After two years, didn't, after two years stay at Mkranza, he left for Aplau EP Primary Experimental School where he became the head teacher and cut keys from 1968 to 1975. In 1974, very Reverend Amenyedu answered God's call and entered the Peki EP Church Seminary for Pastoral Training. He was ordained the following year in 1975 and posted to Wei doubling as a teacher and a pastor of the EP Church. But his stay at Way was brief because he accepted an invitation to become the chaplain of Anglo Secondary School. He voluntarily retired in 1977 after serving as chaplain at Anseco for three years. In 1978, very Reverend Aminyedu was posted to Pando District having now become a full-time pastor. He stayed in Pando for two years and was transferred back to Wei for a year. In, 1990, in 1982, he became the parish pastor at Kita. Very Reverend Amenyedu served the Lord with dedication and enthusiasm until 1990. Within the eight years period, he held several positions, including chairman of the Southern Presbytery of the EP Church and a member of the Synod Committee. In 1988, the EP Church in Ghana was engulfed in constitutional crisis, which eventually resulted in the split of the church into EP Church Ghana and EP Church of Ghana. The EP Church of Ghana now Global Evangelical Church presented, represented by the concerned members who were at the forefront of the battle to restore truth and constitutional order into the AP Church, nominated very Reverend Amenyedu to be appointed as acting moderator of the AP Church of Ghana in 1991. Their decision was based on the provision of Article 29 in the 1979 Constitution, which stipulated that in the absence of a moderator, the oldest serving pastor, who was also a presbytery chairman on the Synod Committee, should act as moderator. Very Reverend Amenyedu was the one who qualified under those stipulations. Reverend Amenyedu, was formally invited to take up the vacant position as the acting moderator of the AP Church of Ghana with the full blessing of his wife, Mrs. Ella Doka Samenyedu, who stood by him and prayed fervently with him. He accepted the responsibility to lead the AP Church of Ghana, knowing very well the dangers ahead of him. He was later confirmed at the 52nd Synod in 1993 as a substantive moderator. Very Reverend Amenyedu thus become, became the first moderator of the AP Church of Ghana, 
now Global Evangelical Church at a tumultuous period, but with level-headedness, maturity, dexterity, faith in God, and tremendous co cooperation he received from the Synod clerk, Reverend Victor E. Otitiaku, and the programs and interchurch relations secretary, Reverend Dr. Command of Philemon Franque, he brought stability and charted an enduring path for the church. As the pioneering moderator of a church born out of conflict, very Reverend Amenyedu had to contend with a myriad of challenges, both from within and from without. His enemies were numerous, and he could say with the Apostle Paul, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Very Reverend Amenyedu, with his dedicated team, raised the AP Church of Ghana from ground zero to the high pedestal in the ecclesiastical community to the admiration of many. His tenors saw a rapid growth of the church physically and spiritually. He served the church without any desire for pecs. He walked distances and traveled miles on public buses to work for Christ. But all these difficulties grew dim in the light of the tremendous blessing he received from the Lord. After four years in office as moderator, he stepped down at the age of 70. Very Reverend Amenyedu was a servant leader. He valued diverse opinions opinions, cultivated trust, and build the, the spirit of the core. He was teachable, down to earth, and ready to take every suggestion on board. He was never afraid or felt inferior to consult on matters beyond him. He was a critical thinker and a team player. He never projected himself or imposed his ideas on anybody. He was constantly interested in the development of others. The whole church was his constituency, and he had no vested interest. Of course, he was human. He made mistakes, but he pondered these mistakes and quickly learned from them. They were not repeated, and he grew and learned from them because he had the learning spirit. Very Reverend Amenyedu was called home to glory on the 26th of October, 2018. He could look back on who he was and what he had achieved. If he could look back on who he was and what he had achieved, he might be surprised to see that his Humility, modesty, integrity, sacrifices, and passion to serve has resulted in a great movement and a growing church we now call the Global Evangelical Church. Above everything else, he loved the Lord deeply and his wife, Ella, and his five children unreservedly. This is the man we are celebrating today. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Tessano Youth Choir. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm back again this time to do the introduction for the reason why we are gathered here this afternoon. I'm here to introduce to you the personality that will deliver this inaugural address or lecture. And this personality whom will do this for us is an experienced educator and clergy. He is a graphic artist, a publisher, and a theologian. He is an old Marulian and a graduate of the University of Science and Technology, Kumasi, where he obtained his BA in art, graphic design to be precise, and also a postgraduate diploma in economics and industrial management. He was in the London College of Printing, UK, where he obtained another postgraduate diploma in printing and publishing studies at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, Ibadan, Nigeria. He obtained a certificate in editing and publication. After these, he launched into theological education and obtained a diploma in biblical studies from the Christian Service College, now the Christian University College, Kumasi. He also obtained an MA in Christian School Administration and Management from the famous Ora Robert University, Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the USA. And then went on to obtain his terminal degree, degree PhD, from Newberg Theological Seminary, Newberg in the USA. And his field was in Christian school education. He has several publications to his credit, notable is 21 books. He has three journal articles published in his name, and he co-authored two books. In his working life, he had worked as a lecturer at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Kumasi, from 1984 to October 2013. Whilst there, he held many positions, including being a lecturer, head of department, dean of the College of Education. He is also, he also served as the internal examiner for PhD studies and vice dean of the same college. Between 2008 and 2009, he served as the president of the Association of African Researchers and Teachers of Publishing. This gentleman is a pastor of the Global Evangelical Church. And as a pastor of the Global Evangelical Church, he had pastored Emmanuel Chapel Angonga in Kumasi, and also the Praise Chapel, the First English Assembly of the Global Evangelical Church, the Power Chapel Community 4 Tema. He was also a missionary pastor responsible for the church in the UK, the mission field of the Global Evangelical Church. And he oversaw the churches are called the Ham Ham churches, the Stratham, the Dagenham, and Tottenham churches. Our speaker is married to a beautiful lecturer in French at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Dr. Mrs. Lebene Ajou Tete. This affable personality is none other than the immediate past moderator of the Global Evangelical Church. Will you please help me welcome the very Reverend Dr. Edem Kwaku Tete to deliver the inaugural address. Please, shall we be seated? (laughs) 
I don't know whether to start with hallelujah or praise the Lord. Uh, a cousin of mine who just came in shared an interesting happening with me some years back. It was a gathering like this. And the crowd belonged to a particular church. And the greetings they know is and with your spirit. So they expect the speaker to say, the Lord be with you, and they would answer with your spirit. So when a uh, chairman was trying to operate the mic and it wasn't working, that man, that priest who came forward to speak to them said, there is something wrong with the mic. And then the whole crowd responded, and with your spirit. So you are welcome. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, Honorable Moderator, Senior Clerk, members of the Senior Committee, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I want to make a confession. I accepted to deliver this inaugural lecture with a deep sense of humility because I least expected to be listed among those to be considered for the task. I did not object to taking up the task because a lecture organized in the memory of the very Reverend Edward Amenyedu is an activity to celebrate someone I regard as a gem among leaders. He was a servant of Christ to be named among distinguished leaders of the churches of Christ in Ghana. The topic chosen for this inaugural lecture is Contemporary Leadership Challenges Confronting the Church of Christ in Ghana. Contemporary Leadership Challenges Confronting the Church of Christ in Ghana. And this is the path I wish to traverse with you in my discourse. We shall begin with a brief genesis of the Church of Christ in Ghana. Then we'll look at the importance of leadership in the corporate and Christian worlds. We shall stop there and consider the virtues that have come together to crown the very Reverend Edward Amenyedu as a transformational Christian leader. Thereafter, we shall look at the various levels of leadership in the Church of Christ in Ghana. From there, we shall proceed to discuss four critical areas of leadership challenges I, leadership challenge I see confronting the leadership of Christ's church in Ghana. I intend to bring the curtain down by providing some credible solutions to leadership challenges and my closing remarks. In order not to bore you, there will be some one or two video clips to buttress the topic we are looking at this evening. My aim in all this is to remind us that Christ who is the head of his church, expects us to be conquerors, overcomers of whatever confronts us 
in our journey to the promised, to his promised home, that is heaven. Even the challenges confronting the Church of Christ in Ghana. An unknown historian has written that the arrival of the Europeans in the 15th century into the then Gold Coast brought Christianity to our land, our beloved land called the Gold Coast then and now Ghana. There were many different cultural groups across the West African region who were practicing different forms of spirituality. As the Europeans explored and took control of parts of the country during the colonial days, so did their religion. Christianity is the religion with the largest following in Ghana. Christian denominations include Catholics, Methodists, Anglicans, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Seventh-day Adventists, Pentecostals, Baptists, Evangelical Charismatics, Later-day Saints, and so on and so forth. According to the census figures of the year 2000, out of Ghana's 18.8 million people, Christians made up 69% of the population of Ghana. The 2010 population and housing census puts the figure slightly over 71% of the total population of over 24 million people. The unifying organization of Christians in the country is the Ghana Christian Council, founded in 1929, representing Methodist, Anglican, Mennonite, Presbyterian, Evangelical Presbyterian, African Methodist, Episcopal, Zionist, Christian Methodist, Evangelical, Lutheran, and the Baptist churches, and the Society of Friends. The council serves as a link with the World Council of Churches and other ecumenical bodies. The Seventh-day Adventist is not a member of the Christian Council, has a strong presence in Ghana. The church opened the premier private Christian university in Ghana. Then, the National Catholic Secretariat established in 1960 also coordinates the different in-country dioceses. These Christian organizations concerned primarily with the spiritual affairs of their congregations have acted in circumstances described by the government as political. Such was the case in 1991, when both the Conference of Catholic Bishops and the Christian Council called, the milit called on the military government the Provisional National Defense Council to return the country to a constitutional rule. Then we have the Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council made up of over 250 churches. The founding denominations are the Assemblies of God Church, Christ Apostolic Church, the Apostolic Church, Ghana, and then the Church of Pentecost. Some other members of the GPCC are the Global Evangelical Church, the Royal House Chapel, Perez Chapel, Fountain Gate Chapel, and the Lost Pentecostal Church, just to mention a few. Let me confess that the majority of Christians in Ghana belong to churches under Ghana Pentecostal Council and Charis Ghana Pentecostal and Charismatic Council churches. The last but not the least of, of mention is the National Association of Charismatic Churches. Their membership include Action Chapel International, Lighthouse Chapel International, Victory Bible 
Church International and others. Many of the independent or one-man churches we have in Ghana are offshoots from these bigger denominations. They are many and they do not belong to these councils. Together, they represent the Church of Christ in Ghana. I want you to bear this in mind as we proceed. The importance of leadership is revealed in the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 15 and verse 14. Jesus said, let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Our Lord Jesus explained in this verse that the safety of followers are in the hands of those who lead them. And woe to the ones being led if their leader has nothing to offer beyond what they already have. The Webster's Dictionary defines leadership as the capacity to guide the actions of a person or a group. Leighton Ford suggests that early studies in leadership reveal two important factors about leaders. The first is that leaders take the lead that is, they initiate ideas and plans. Second, leaders move people to follow them by showing them consideration. We can therefore say that in matters of leadership, much is expected of the leader. I therefore agree with Miles Monroe, who defined leadership as the capacity to influence others through the inspiration motivated by passion, generated by a vision, produced by conviction, and ignited by a purpose. Unquote. Leadership, therefore, serves several functions which are crucial to the success of an organization or the church. One of the most important functions of a leader is to provide a vision for the organization or the church. The leader explains the vision and what members of the organization must do to achieve this vision. While an organization may have people with various talents, gifts, and capabilities, it is expected that leadership would harness individual efforts towards the collective goal by inspiring and motivating teams and coordinating personnel actions for the advancement of a common goal. Leaders help their companies to achieve excellence. In the Bible, we have a number of cases where bad leadership adversely affected people being led and good leadership advanced the cause of people. Let's look at a few. Samson. God gave him as a special judge in Israel from birth to deliver Israel from her enemies but he led a reckless life that made him fall into the hands of the Philistines through immoral relationships. He died, and Israel remained under bondage. The example of Eli. The failure of Eli is a, as a leader was the way he brought up his children they were committing atrocities as priests of God. He failed to rebuke them and ensure they did the right things. 
God was sorely displeased with Eli's children who were working as priests in those days. God allowed the enemies of Israel to defeat them in battle. And in that battle, the sons of Eli died and their father also died when he heard the news of Israel's defeat in battle and the capture of the ark of God. Another example, Saul. Saul started well as a, as a spirit-filled king of Israel. But his life was filled with disobedience to God and with jealousy. He lost the presence of the Holy Spirit in his life as a leader. And God turned his back to him and the whole nation. Eventually, Israel under him was heavily defeated by the Philistines. Now, some positive leaders. David. David was a leader who jealously guarded his relationship and walk with God. He was not perfect, but truly repented from his sins. His reign had a few challenges, but it is regarded as the best in Israel. Moses. The leadership of Moses made him the best leader Israel ever had. He was described as the meekest man that ever lived on earth. One strong point of his leadership was that he constantly stood and interceded for those he led. I have brought these examples to remind us about the importance God attaches to leadership. The very Reverend Amanyedu, I wish Mr. Chairman to make a few remarks about this great man of God. The word of, pro, uh, of God appropriately exhausts us. Remember your leaders and those who spoke the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Today, we are here gathered to memorialize an unsung Christian leader whose leadership credentials resonate rare qualities urgently needed in the Church of Christ in Ghana, which continues to face endemic leadership challenges. The very Reverend Edward Amanyedu was indeed a great spiritual leader who personified seventh leadership in the church he led. Even though he was neither in the forefront nor involved in the legal tussle that culminated into the famous Accra High Court ruling that gave birth to the split, I dare call him the father of the Yippie Church of Ghana. I say that because it was his acceptance to lead the Yippie Church of Ghana faction of the split that gave legality to what we have today as the global evangelical church. I wish to draw upon some leadership models from the corporate world to, mag to magnify the leadership affirmation very Reverend Edward Amenyedu delivered in his lifetime. There are a number of models of leadership usually identified by leadership experts. Among these, I consider transformational leadership model to be the one that fits very Reverend Amenyedu's leadership example more than others. According to Sarah White, 2018, the transformational leadership model encourages leaders to demonstrate authentic, strong leadership with the idea that employees will be inspired to follow suit. Barry Sherry, 2020, described Transformational leadership style, describing transformational leadership style, writes, 
I quote, transformational leadership is a leadership style that can inspire positive changes in those who follow. Transformational leaders are generally energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate. The very Reverend Edward Amenyedu was indeed a strong leader whose character was the bedrock of his authentic leadership style. His character was inspiring and it affected those who came close to him positively. He was an embodiment of humility and an incarnation of bravery. Enthusiasm and passion were the drive of his leadership activities. Again, Sarah White cites Bernard Bass, 1985, listing the characteristics of a transformational leader as follows. Encourages the motivation and positive development of workers, exemplifies moral standards with the organization, and encourages the same of others. Fosters ethical work environment with clear values, prioritize the, and clear values, priorities, and standards. Again, transformational leader builds company culture by encouraging employees to move from an, an attitude of self-interest to a mindset where they are working for a common good, holds an emphasis on authentic cooperation and open communication, provides coaching and mentoring, but allowing employees to make decisions and take ownership of tasks. The examples of transformational Christian leadership skills demonstrated by the very Reverend Edward Amenyedu in his lifetime dates as far back as 1975, when he was ordained into the pastoral ministry. The testimony given at the end of his life, of his life concerning his four-year tenure as moderator, vividly confirms the fact that he ordinarily displayed the characteristics of a transformational leader. Some of the portions I have here, especially what I wanted to say has been said already in his profile. I want to say that very Reverend Amenyedu in his lifetime and ministry suffered a lot of harassment under mod the moderatorship of the very Reverend Professor Jobo. He was not liked by Professor Jobo because he would not agree with him on the new doctrinal teachings he, Professor Jobo, was introducing in the church. In addition, later, during Professor Jobo's tenure as moderator, very Reverend Amenyedu became the oldest presbytery chairman who would act as moderator when the need arose. When, because of him, the moderator denied Keta congregation help in any form, very Reverend Amenyede would mobilize the congregation to fend for themselves through voluntary work of which he was part. The acquisition of the UAC building at Keta for the Keta parish was through his wise and visionary leadership. One aspect of Reverend Amenyedu's character was the forgiveness he easily and always extended to those who offended him, especially during the early years of the split. Even when he became moderator, he could have settled scores with those who offended him, but he would not. And he was not vindictive either. He was selfless and would not make demands for his personal comfort. Reverend Amenyedu was a giver. He taught his congregations to give 
through the demonstration of sacrificial giving, he exhibited, especially when he was at the Keta Parish, it was said that he could give as much as, as, much as half his salary during a fundraising at Keta. A lot of young people who met Reverend Amenyedu would testify that he was very generous with words of encouragement to urge them on in life and ministry. He selected and trained people with the potential to lead in the church. One of his disciples, Aketa, testifies that the quality of training which they received from very Reverend Amenyedu was unparalleled. This made them superiors among their peers from other congregations. Even though very Reverend Amenyedu was not a member of the Bible study and prayer group, he would visit the group during their Bible study sessions and express his appreciation about the progress members were making in Bible knowledge. His comments urged the members to improve their literacy levels in the Bible. The very Reverend Aminyadu was indeed a servant leader and a transformational Christian leader who provided solutions to challenges faced by individuals, families, congregations, presbyteries, and movements like the one that gave birth to Ipi Church of Ghana. His legacies live on. I want to pause here and allow the technicians to show a video clip on leadership and I'll continue. So we want an Africa that is free of violent conflict and war. What leadership do you produce to get that result? This is at OAU conference. All the glory belongs to you. We have to answer this question first. What is the Africa we want? So we say we want an Africa that is free of violent conflict and war. What leadership do you produce to get that result? We want an Africa that is free from poverty. What kind of leadership do you need to create to, to end that poverty? We want an Africa that is free of, that, that, that is driven by women's emancipation. Where is this leadership? How do you create it? We want an Africa that is free of corruption. How do you produce this leadership that is not corrupt? Now, these are the questions that we've got to answer, these practical things that President Kagame was talking about. And it's not an easy question to answer. But I think critically, and we were discussing this thing yesterday, critically, we need a critical self-assessment of ourselves as Africans. To say, as, as, President, as President Kagame was saying, we've been discussing this thing about the quality of leadership challenges we face for a very long time. But when have we sat down to say, now let us assess, you no, know, you, 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 Tabo Mbeki, were president of South Africa for so long. Let's assess your performance. Did you provide this kind of leadership that is suitable for this Africa that we want? Where did you go wrong? We've got the African peer review mechanism which President Obasanjo can speak about. That's part of what it was supposed to do. So that we sit as peers to say, no, but the President, you are misbehaving. You are stealing public resources. You've accessed power in order to put money in your pocket. This is not the leadership we want. But we are not doing that sufficiently because we are afraid. We're afraid to speak frankly to one another about the wrong things that we're doing. 
And I think if we don't do that, we will meet a century hence to discuss the same question. I think that critical self-assessment of the continent is necessary. And I, I mean a real, critical, truthful self-assessment that's critical. And I think that's a very, that would be an important step forward in terms of uh, producing this kind of leadership which Africa wants. Everywhere in the world, leadership is being discussed. And its importance yep. is being re reiterated. And so, what we just saw, the clip, one of the African leaders was stressing the need for us as leaders to critically assess our leadership because we need leadership at all levels. Now, let's continue. I want to talk about the levels of leadership in the church. Some of you may be thinking, I'm not a moderator, I'm not a pastor, and so I'm not a leader. But we have leadership at various levels. The Church of Christ operates at various levels of, various, of leadership. This can be identified from what one experiences at home, offered by fathers, up to what is offered at denominational level by archbishops, bishops, right reverends, chairmen, etc., as the case may be. The first category I want to talk about is home leadership. The family as the smallest unit of society is usually under the leadership of man who is mandated by God to be the head. The quality of leadership that a man offers at home is the sum of what he learned from his upbringing and what the church offers him by way of training. It is at home that a good foundation is laid for children and youth, not only to be responsible citizens, but also faithful stewards and leaders of the church. The role of schools and churches in the upbringing of children and youth are merely supplementary to what the home offers. Therefore, the leadership that the family members receive under their head, parents, as the case may be, to a large extent determines what they become. When a church, by its programs and activities, intentionally prepares men and women to be effective leaders at home, the result will be the availability of more and more people with the potential to offer quality leadership at all levels of church leadership. Unfortunately, the church has woefully failed in its duty to help parents to offer inspirational and quality leadership that young people need. Church programs aimed at the family are mostly about preparation uh, for and consummation of marriage. The burden of parenting, which is quite complicating, is left to inexperienced young couples to figure out for themselves. And the result is what our youth, and for that matter, our society has become. We may conclude in the end that many of the contemporary leadership challenges that the Church of Christ faces have the home as their source. The second level of leadership is ministry leadership. By ministry leadership, I'm referring to leadership offered by people usually elected to manage the affairs of various groups in the church for a period. 
people are elected to such leadership positions based upon the confidence reposed in them by group members who have observed them and noticed such qualities as they think their leaders should have. Group leadership generally has become the breeding ground from which other levels of leadership have emerged. You may have, you may have observed that many who have played active role in group leadership in the congregations have progressed to congregational leadership and some have eventually become denominational leaders. The challenge I find facing leadership at this level is that the needed training is often not made available to them to do their work effectively and to give them the preparation they need for higher calling. The third level is congregational leadership. Congregational leadership, leaders in this category include bishops, prophets, pastors, evangelists, deacons, elders, catechists, teachers, etc. They are leaders who come together to form the management of a congregational or congregation or local church. Their nomenclature varies according to the denomination they belong to. Leadership delivery at the congregational level is critical for the membership of the church. That individual, that individual who has been drawn by the Holy Spirit to belong to the church, to the body of Christ, By the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, cautions such leaders in Acts 20, Acts 20, 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Congregational leaders are being exhorted to bear in mind that it caused the precious blood of the owner of the church, Jesus Christ, to bring the church into existence. Paul went on to remind them that the work of leadership involves uh, being very much. Peter similarly cautions congregational leaders, among other things, to be wary of shameful gain, which seems to dominate the attitude of more leaders of the Church of Christ in Ghana today in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 to 4. I have found that the purpose of the call of congregational leadership is not clear to most leaders in this category. This I perceive as the greatest challenge facing them. Therefore, the problems of most leaders in this bracket is largely attitude now. Before I get on to church or denominational leadership, I want to pause again. And then I want another video clip to be given us. Uh, I want to remove some sweat and then we shall continue. It is said 50 years ago, some of the major problems we experienced included sticking to chewing gum under tables, coughing in class, and missing deadlines. Today, 
of school face gun and knife crime, bullying on dangerous levels of stress, drug abuse, depression, and suicide. To effectively address the serious challenge that our children face, we need to consider not only the problems with individual students, but the very system of education that they are subjected to. Academic intelligence may make a child successful in the world, but compassion will make them desperate. When we teach values alongside academics, we will find that children will be much happier, more successful, and will develop into great leaders that will change the future of how we are doing. The word education is derived from the Latin word educare, which means to lead up or to bring out from within. Education is actually about bringing out the unique individual potential of every child, teaching them how to approach the hurdles, shortcomings, and setbacks of life, while empowering them to be vehicles of love and hope for the world. It is said, if you lose your wealth, you lose nothing. If you lose your health, you lose something. But if you lose your character, you lose everything. Without stressing these truths, the opposite will be understood by default. That is, if you lose your character, you lose nothing. If you lose your health, you lose something. If you lose your wealth, you lose everything. It should be a top priority of our education system to ensure that our children get this right. Imagine an education system where children are taught that the only time we should look down on someone is if we can help them up. Imagine a system where children are taught to judge beauty by what is within people's heart, not by their physical appearance. Imagine a system where character is given as much importance as competence, where children are taught the helping a billion people is even more valuable than being a billionaire, where as well as learning to raise their standard of living, they are also taught to increase their standard of giving, where children are taught to measure their success by how happy and fulfilled they are and not how many letters they have after their names. An education system where developing intelligence goes hand in hand with developing compassion. Imagine, imagine if as well as learning the history of our world, they are given the skills to change the future of it. Imagine if as well as learning to navigate the world, they learn how to navigate their own minds. This is not an imagination. It is possible if we genuinely begin to value kindness over character over success and integrity above money. And in this way, change the system in which our children grow and learn. Mr. Chairman, I have shown this clip to emphasize a certain need which we have when we're talking about leadership. 
I'll come to that very shortly. The fourth and final category of leadership is denominational or church leadership, where we have moderators, we have archbishops, where we have uh, chairmen. Being in charge of denomination, leading, being given authority to point the way the denomination must go. And this, for someone to ascend to this position, sometimes it is by election, sometimes it is inherited, but we have various systems in our country. I have written a bit about this for us to discuss. But at this point, I want to hammer the real challenges which I think are facing the leadership of the Church of Christ today. The first challenge I want to point out is that the quality of leaders that we have, many of them appear not to be prepared for leadership. I'm talking about the fact that we need excellence in leadership. And to be able to get an excellent leader, we have to look at what that leader is producing. God's standards are very high. And whenever he calls people, he makes sure that the resources are available. Not only that, he also prepares them. But in the Church of Christ today in Ghana, one problem we have with people who are in leadership is that they are not prepared. In preparation, we are talking about the person going through a process of becoming ready to deliver. God prepares people before he puts them into leadership. If we take the example of Moses, God made him to be prepared in Pharaoh's palace for 40 years. Then he thought he was ready to lead. But God said, Moses, you are not ready. Because of the action he took, God sentenced him to 40 years of shepherding in the wilderness. And we all know the story very well. When he was 80, God appeared to him and told him to go and lead the people out. God now found him prepared for the job. But Moses was giving some flimsy excuses, which God would not take. And God insisted, and Moses went ahead, and he was a leader. When you read, you can find many... Uh, another person was Joseph. Again, Joseph acknowledged to his brothers that his leadership position, which he occupied, was given to him by God. How did God prepare him? In Potiphar's house and in prison. When the time came, the time of waiting for two solid years uh, after he interpreted dreams. He learned to be patient with God. Today, we take people through seminary programs to ensure their ministerial formation. It is a good thing, but I consider that it's not good enough. 
I say so because every potential leader of God's people must exhibit enough evidence of God's preparation experience. This, among other things, must include the person's in-depth experiential knowledge of God and his own human and interpersonal relations. When a church expects leaders, they release to congregations to learn leadership on the job, the result is maximizing casualties within the flock of God. A disaster unleashed on the flock of God through unprepared spiritual leadership. In plain language, I want to say that the precious souls won for Christ through hard work can be lost due to poor and unprepared leadership. Mr. Chairman, permit me to sit and continue as I have been asked to do. Uh, the second challenge being faced by the issue of leadership in the church is character. Uh, character flaws which we find in leaders. The importance of character in leadership delivery has been of great concern to many, for many generations. Uh, Aristotle pointed out some very important things about leadership. Uh, these three pillars are better known as ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos stands for character. Pathos stands for your relationships. And logos, what you know or your knowledge. Again, Miles Monroe, in his book, The Power of Character in Leadership, wrote, without the element of strong, noble, honorable character, leadership and all potential achievements are in danger of cancellation. Mark Monroe wants us to know that character is everything. Character, the character of a leader is so important that no matter what the person achieves, if he has a flaw in character, all his achievements will become nothing. You remember what Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 7. Let me read from verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You recognize them by their fruits. Are graves gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? By this statement, Jesus taught that the character of a leader tells his followers whether his leadership is genuine or not. Therefore, when a church leader fails to allow the Holy Spirit to transform and sanctify him, his leadership becomes questionable. There are some traits which must be gotten rid of in the lives of leaders. They are destructive and they can vaporize any good work God is doing through a leader. We find these traits in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through 14. They include sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talks. The word of God says, if these are in you, and you are a leader, either at home or in the church, 
or on top of the church, you can score zero or you can be brought low if these traits dominate your life. I dare say that many leaders in Ghana are being brought down because of this. Let's not forget Moses. That great and equal leader had a problem. And the problem he had was just anger on just one occasion. And God would not take it. He could not lead Israel to the promised land because of this problem of anger in his life. If God is so strict, has he lowered the standards today? My brothers and sisters, it is sad that many of us leaders at home and in the church, we are not able to guard our character. The church in Ghana, unfortunately, has experienced divisions and breakups because of unhealthy relationships and selfishness among leaders often fueled by unforgiveness. Sexual immorality has also destroyed the ministry of many Christian leaders in Ghana, and it is common. One bane of leadership relating to character which is destroying the testimony of the church is the love of money by leadership of the church coupled by affluent lifestyle. These days, many to be counted among top leaders of the church would do anything, would say anything, and produce anything to raise money for themselves. It is sad. The third problem leaders have in Ghana is the leader's lack of vision. Mr. Chairman, I wish to anchor this part of my submission on the importance of vision in leadership to some quotes of some experts. One says the very essence of leadership is that you have to have a vision. It is got to be a vision you articulate clearly and, force, and forcefully on every occasion. This was by Theodore Hesburgh, president of the University of Notre Dame. The Bible sums up the importance of vision in uh, Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. In the church of Christ, leaders owe it a duty to lead with vision and articulate their visions very clearly so that members can be sure of the destiny they are pursuing. The Lord in, the, in Habakkuk urged the prophet that the vision should be written and made plain so that he who takes it will run with it. Brothers and sisters, I wish to state here that there is only one vision of the Church of Christ, and that is the vision of eternal life, the vision of a home in heaven one day. And if we are not able to articulate this very clearly to our membership, if we are making members to be looking at things on earth as what there is for the church today, we are misleading them. The church needs leaders who will be able to articulate very clearly the vision of the kingdom of God and educate our members to follow after this vision. Now, it is not only leaders who become challenges to themselves as the leadership of the church. 
The problem we have with leadership in the church has to do with the people we are leading. And in this area, I have identified four uh, weaknesses we find in our congregation. The first one is that many of our membership, the members of the church, don't have strong foundations. They have very, very weak foundations. And so their lives as Christians uh, does not match up with what the Bible says. In Ghana, for example, we say we have over 70%. Therefore, we have very corrupt people in the church. And this should not be. The reason simply is that the members of the church have very weak foundations. And so they are not able to live the Christian life. Many of them are not repentant. They don't understand repentance. In Hebrews chapter 6, repentance is supposed to be a fundamental, a foundational teaching. But if you have not repented, you go back to the same sin over and over again. This is describing the life of the members of our church. They have weak foundations. The second problem of the uh, uh, membership is that they are illiterate when it comes to Bible knowledge. Uh, I have found out that many of our people in the church cannot read and write. Many of them have been to school, but they are semi-literate. In fact, because they have stopped school, they are growing fast into illiteracy. Many of them do not know the Bible. They have not been reading the Bible. The Bible is a very powerful tool God has given us. It is so powerful that Russia and China, they are afraid of the Bible, and so they have banned the Bible. In Ghana, Bible Society and Theovision International, they are producing Bible in text and audio Bible, but our people are not buying. They have bought, but they are not reading. This is the problem we have. Leadership has membership who do not know their left and right. If you ask them, where in the Bible is found, heaven helps those who help themselves, they will start looking through the Bible. They don't know that it is not in the Bible. That is the sort of people we have in the church. They're illiterate so long as the Bible is concerned. The third thing which we have as a problem in our membership or in our congregation is what we can term syncretism. Here we are simply talking about two different beliefs being brought together. That is what member we see in the lives of members of our church. They appreciate and believe what the church is preaching, but they also believe in traditional religion. They also see power in occultism. And so they are practicing these things side by side with the Christian teachings. And it makes the message of the gospel to be what the world frowns upon. They laugh at us. Juju men or traditional priests laugh at us because it is people in the church who come to them for more power. So the problem of leadership is that we have membership who are practicing Christianity and yet practicing uh, traditional religion and occultism at the same time. The final thing about membership is what I call spiritual consumerism. What we mean simply is that right now in our churches, members, as it were, have gone to a party where they have buffet. 
they take the message that pastors preach in the church as buffet. So we want this one. After this one, we don't like it. This one, yes, we want a bit of it. In the church today, we have members who want to listen to prophetic messages. Uh, uh, somebody to come and tell them, this is what will happen to you, or this is what has happened in your family. When such programs are being run, members are very happy. And so when you don't bring people like that, they leave the church and they go to other places. It is like going to mall, the mall and looking for what you like. This is what the church has become. Or this is how members of the church has turned to. They want you to bring them what they like, not what the Bible says you should preach and teach them. The other challenge of uh, Christian leadership is what I term leadership succession. Leadership succession. How denominational leaders are replaced when they are no longer there. This is a very, very uh, important challenge leadership is facing. Uh, in Ghana, the orthodox or traditional churches like Global Presbyterian Church, Evangelical Presbyterian Methodist, they have constitutions which spell out how leadership should be changed. But even then, when the church meets to choose leaders, there are problems. There was an occasion where a denomination gathered to elect their chairman. And there was so much campaign. People are saying these leaders who are put forward, one of them comes from the north and one of them comes from the south. And so that divided the church. Those from the south say a person must be in charge. Those from the north say our uh, leader must be the one to lead us. This is the church of God. And if members will become divided, tribalistic tendencies, factionalism, if we see this uh, common in our church uh, leadership succession, then we are of most people to be greatly pitied. Brothers and sisters, apart from the fact that Orthodox churches have this problem of factionalism and tribalism in leadership succession, the one-man churches or the, uh, those we call, the, yeah, the one-man churches, they have their founders. And when you observe very carefully, the founders, they raise their children so that when they are no more, they will take over from them. So the church has become a family business. The question I'm asking today is that, is this the type of succession Christ wants for his church? Or we, members of the church, have decided what we should be having. Another challenge I found, that is the fourth challenge I have found about the church, is the fact that the church of, Ghana, of Christ in Ghana has almost lost its taste. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltness be restored? It is no longer good for anything. These are the words of Jesus Christ. In Ghana today, the church, we should be on top of issues. Um, is being ridiculed. When you read the news on the social media these days, people are asking, 
in the light of all that is happening in the country today, where is Christian Council? Where is GPCC? Where are the leaders who were have spoken some few years back? What are, where are they? The simple reason is that most of our church leaders have gone to bed with politicians. Many of them have got their pockets being lined by money. I spoke to a pastor on the phone. I've never met him, but a friend introduced him to me. Uh, he said they were invited to a hotel in Accra here, and he didn't go. And those who went came back and said they were given envelopes. And the reason they were given envelopes, you already know, you already know what I'm going to say, is because of political influence. The church in Ghana has lost its taste and we cannot speak. John the Baptist, when Herod did a wrong thing going for after the, 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 the uh, brother's uh, wife, he, he spoke against it. He ended up in prison and Jesus commended him. Brothers and sisters, if the church prefers to speak well of politicians, then we have lost our taste. We are no longer worthy of being called the Church of Christ. Very soon, we will just be the, like what happened to the Methodist Church in Ghana. The LGBTQ people, they give out money a lot. And if our leaders love money and the LGBTQ people come to them with money, you won't be surprised. In some few years to come, we shall all vote that gay marriage would, should be part of the church. It is a sad thing. Now, providing solution, as I come to the, uh, towards the end of my presentation, what is the solution to these problems that is facing leadership in the church? What should we do? Mr. Chairman, I want to, because of time, provide only two uh, uh, solutions. I will suggest only two solutions. And I'm addressing this solution especially to global evangelical church. I believe that we should start solving the problem with our children. We must start solving the character problem from the way we train our children. And the training of our children, I am addressing the church because the church must take the lead in providing education. I don't mean what we do in our Sunday schools. When the missionaries came, they came with education. They started the schools. They started the training colleges. EP Church started a major training college for teachers. You see, the teachers we have in our schools are part of the problem. Those who are teaching our children in our schools are part of the problem. If we will continue to leave education to the government to run, then don't expect any character change. We'll continue to have the problems we have. The late Professor Dovlo gave uh, an interesting uh, uh, example that happened in the Department of Religions. He said, on the staff, they have a Muslim who teaches or who is a lecturer. Now, there was a student who enrolled and was admitted in the Department of Religions. This student is a daughter of a pastor. One day, the pastor came and complained. My daughter came home and said, he's no longer going to, to, to be a Christian. 
she wants to be a Muslim. And the reason is simple. That Muslim lecturer impacted her so much that she sees Christianity, which his father is following and is asking her also to follow, as nonsense. She preferred to be a Muslim. I want to suggest to us that teaching is a religious exercise. And many of our students in elementary schools, in secondary schools, and in the universities are being impacted by teachers who are giving them you know, values which will not make their character excellent. Would you have a Catholic school headed by a Protestant? No. Would you have a Muslim school headed by a Christian who knows the Quran so much? No. Meanwhile, our so-called schools, the, the teachers who are in it, they, they are from any religion. We don't mind. We just continue to employ them and they continue influencing our people. Global Evangelical Church, for 30 years, we have not, as a church, started a school. We have a lot of teachers, but the only thing important to us is to train pastors. But teachers can also influence children or students and help them. I was privileged to be educated at Oral Roberts University. The lecturers of this university, set up by a, uh, a great man of God, Oral Roberts, you can't teach in that university if you are not a born-again Christian, spirit-filled with the zeal, you know, to evangelize. The lecturers are all just that. No wonder people like Miles Monroe were all produced by Oral Roberts University. I want to suggest that if in Ghana we want to solve the problem of character, we must start, go back to our schools. I was returning from Basel uh, with uh, the general secretary of the general, the second, the clerk of the general assembly of the Presbyterian Church. And when we were conversing on our flight, I got to know that even though the government has taken over the Presbyterian schools, the church has a private educational unit that caters for schools which the government has nothing to do. That is what the Presbyterian Church has, 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 has done. And they are sure that in those private schools that they have set up, they will be able to let the children who go through that, those schools be brought up with the right values. Global Evangelical Church, I think that teacher training is very, very important. Listen to something that I came across recently. Uh, it was written by a survivor of a consecration camp after World War II. This is what the teacher, the person wrote. Dear teachers, I am a survivor of a concentration camp. My eyes saw what no man should witness. Gas chambers built by learned engineers. Children poisoned by educated physicians. Infants killed by trained nurses. Women and babies shot and burned by high school and college graduates. I am suspicious of education. My request is help your students to become human. 
Your efforts should never produce learned monsters, skilled psychopaths, educated illiterates. Reading, writing, and arithmetic are important only if they serve towards making our children more humane. Let me stand as I say this. Mr. Chairman, I have personally followed your progress as a professional educationist. You are an experienced retired head of secondary and tertiary institution, and your success in educational leadership is unparalleled in the um, Ghana Education Service and Global Evangelical Church. In my opinion, the Global Evangelical Church is wasting you as a parish pastor. You could be... <coughs> you could be tasked by the church with setting up an appropriate Christian educational institution for the Global Evangelical Church. And by God's grace, I am certain your success will be phenomenal. Let me come back again with this. We should task the Global Theological Seminary, Mr. Chairman, to help us solve leadership problems. Again, I'm suggesting that the Global Theological Seminary must be charged with designing um, leadership programs which would adequately and effectively prepare leaders for all levels of leadership in the church. Teachers on this program must not be appointed based on their academic credentials, but they must have proven records of leadership. My, conclusion, my concluding remarks are this. I wish to recall for our reflection the legacy of transformational Christian leadership that the very Reverend Amenyadu led for us. The solid foundation for his strong leader, exemplary leadership was the pursuance of Christ-like character. He intentionally nurtured his relationships and left indelible impressions on those who met him. His courageous acceptance to lead the Yippie Church of Ghana faction of the split that occurred in the Yippie Church after the famous Accra High Court ruling gave legality to what we now have the, as Global Evangelical Church. We cannot afford to gloss over this gift of a Christian leader that God has given us. His story has made me convinced that leaders do, like Moses, feel an inadequate and are hesitant to take up the mantle of leadership. However, such people are able, by the grace of God, to overcome challenges. I'm grateful to all of you for coming to help us together honor this great man. Let me finally bring the curtain down by saying a verse from Henry Longfellow. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. I wish to thank you all for your listening pleasure. God bless you. Please, this clap is too weak. It is just too weak. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much.
Thank you, very Reverend Dr. Edem Tete. This is a whole semester lecture. And I believe that by now, after you have listened to a good lecture, everybody will want to say, 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 you want to say something. Because we have all learned a lot. But I resist the temptation, just like you. And we'll give that honor to the chairman to give the remarks. But before he gives us the closing remarks, let's invite the Redemption Church Choir from Global Evangelical Church, Manprobi, to give us an interlude. Let's welcome them. The glory belongs to you, oh God. Yeah. All the glory belongs to you.
Thank you. Thank you, Redemption Church Choir, for that beautiful rendition. We shall now invite the chairman to give his closing remarks. Thank you very much, MC, the moderator, our lecturer, Tokbio, ladies and gentlemen. I believe that when a good teacher teaches, two things are possible. Now that the, t the students will be so confused that they can't say anything more. Or that they understood so much that everything is so clear. And I believe that the latter is true. And my job as the chairman and my comment permit me to behave like my father's linguist. My father was a chief and he was made chief soon after he returned from UK. And the linguist held him in such a high esteem that any time my father spoke, he was to speak to the, the crowd. He felt that there was nothing to add, so he said he would tell them, Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that what the... Uh, lecturer has given us is so deep but before I take my seat permit me because he touched my heart it appears that for me I know nothing more than education and anytime you touch education uh, things happen in my spirit I am happy that he has observed that the way to tackle the issues is to go back to our roots and catch them young. And if we follow the history of this church, from the AP church to where we are now, we will discover that the, the gospel did not succeed until schools were built. It is the school children that took up the gospel, that propagated the gospel. And I think it's a good call. And I also think that for us as a church, global evangelical church, Many of us, the elderly ones, are complaining about the dying of our hymns. I was just sharing with him before we came in that one of the things that had helped us in the AP Church to have our hymns was our schools. The hymns I know to sing today, I learned majority of them in school. And so if we don't have schools, we can continue crying about our hymns, but we may have them die. Last year, as the president of the Pastors and Spouses Association, before we went for our meeting, I did a little survey to find out the involvement of pastors in our Sunday schools. And I discovered that many of us pastor only the adults. And so last year, we, we made a call for our pastors to practically get involved in the Sunday schools. Maybe this year we should do a follow-up to see how much that is going. But within that period and now, there's another little survey I have done, and it's a little shocking, which I think that, again, we need to do something more. I have realized that it may not only be enough teaching our children just the raw Bible knowledge. We should also open their eye to see the Christian and religious environment around them. Some interactions I've had with the youth is that some of our children, some of our youth cannot tell the difference between a Bible-believing Christian and an ordinary Christian. At a, at a point, it was shocking to me because of their homes they come from and the things they could articulate in Scripture. 
think that we should do a little more by opening their eyes so that our children may not become naive. The naivety is being preyed upon by all groups that are around. Finally, I want to thank all of you for the support you gave me in steering the affairs of this first memorial lecture to its successful end. And I wish all of us God's blessing, and particularly our speaker, the great blessing of the Lord for giving us the food for thought. For me, the issues you articulate do not only call for action, they also call for prayer. Thank you very much, and may God bless all of us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Reverend Dr. Nyeku Abuti. Shall we now invite Reverend Mrs. Patricia Afene Tegbe Agbo to move the vote of thanks. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, Miaka Fumauda. Amen. Papa Moderator, I consider it a great privilege to give the vote of thanks on this very historic occasion. Mr. Chairman, God has blessed and continues to bless the Global Evangelical Church. He has blessed us with great leaders and continue to do the same. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, why don't you join me to offer a very big clap unto God for how far he has brought the Global Evangelical Church. We are still clapping. First clapping, we are saying thank you, God, for the leadership of the Global Evangelical Church, the past, present, and even the future. Hallelujah. Please keep clapping. First, we are clapping. We are saying thank you, Daddy for the success of today's ceremony. The Lord has been good to us. The Lord has been kind. We enjoyed a very favorable weather and everything went successfully. Glory be unto his holy name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To you, Mr. Chairman, words cannot describe our gratitude to you for the able manner in which you steer today's function to a memorable end. Mr. Chairman, Thank you very much, and may the good Lord continue to increase you in every side in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. And now to you, the, our ex-moderator, the very Reverend Dr. Adam Tete. Indeed, I'm sure that the executive and the planning committee made no mistakes when they chose you to be the one to give the inaugural address. Ex-moderator, you were apt, impactful, and very insightful. In fact, you deserve our salute. Please, take it. <laughs> Hallelujah. And to the current, I mean the sitting leadership. You know, the sages say that a nation that does not honor its heroes is not worth dying for. But you have proved beyond every reasonable doubt that the Global Evangelical Church is worth dying for by instituting this memorial. To you, thank you. To you, we say, Akwenami, Mauna Irami, Waganami, Ajoganu Papo, Le Yesu Christopher, Kome, Blo Amen Gande, Hallelujah. And now to the Amenyedu family, uh, the Senate committee members, our pastors, and your spouses, or our spouses, choristers, presbyters, evangelists, catechists, in fact, our guests, every individual who played diverse roles to ensure that today's ceremony is a success, I say, Akpanami. Nyamin Shramu, 
Mount Airami, Nago Day. In fact, say it in any language that you, you understand. Thank you very much. We are grateful. The Flache, you have a talk to Mount Airami, Bemi Debu, Miawegbe, Ay Antonaiji, Agairami, and Nami Nunya Kula Gomez, and La Messia Bocadrica. But the guy called Conamia mi Colombia Fed Dupawa, Miawe, what the goal is, you found come. Hallelujah. Mada Kuku, Unconye, Aspene. Aya Tanya Mikata Meka Kalete, Fea Mia Mia Fome. Aya Nedonku Egg Befe, as I came here, Duji. Aya Nedonku America, Dakwejia. Nana Gadon Kweji Hambe, Global Evangelical Chetanofa. Aya Akpamanya Glad at Dana Amesiame. Eka was to a de beg the fazan, waje dinue, akonami, mona irami, e wakomikata adomi afete for de dire, le yesu fun come. Amen. Ape, ape, apena, ape dala. Thank you, Reverend Mrs. Apeni, Tigi Agu. We are now drawing to the end of this memorable occasion. And to close us is our very own moderator, the Right Reverend Dr. Seto Kodo Ofori. He will give us the closing prayer and the benediction, after which we will sing the song to God be the glory. It's on page 70 of the brochure. Thank you. Let us pray. I'd wanted you to sit, but you can stand. My prayer is always short. Our Father and our Lord, we want to thank you for this program. We want to thank you for the way it has been planned. We thank you for the delivery of the lecture. Thank you that in listening to the delivery, you have again spoken to us. You have told us things we should be thinking about. We want to thank you for this. We want to dedicate to your hands the church and pray that the best will be gotten out of the institution of this award. Father, thank you for all present. Thank you for the very reverend Ike Amenyedu's family. Father, May this award continue to urge them to press on to do your work, to give themselves to the service of your work. Father, let this apply to all of us as well. We want to thank you for bringing us together. Lord, we are about to go home and we pray that you lead us home swiftly. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's receive the benediction. Go in the strength and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Be fruitful in all your endeavors. Love one another. Seek peace. And may the peace of God which passes every understanding rest and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen.
Photographs. I am Ernestina Novieto, your MC for the day. God bless you. Shall we please have all clergy in front? Executive, have your seat here, and then all clergy, please join the executive, please. Thank you. Well done. Please, the family, get ready to join the clergy. Very Reverend Amanyo Dupomato, you know, Klalo Bena, Sofo de Vokwa, Miaoha, Mia de Kula, Sofwa, Kula, Nuno Lao Kata.
From where? Oh, Joseph Tosu. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Aba Hamana, I'll be on the Shidam among the Ponchi. Agba, any Hamafa. Na me ana wonma e vele anya domanyin na me ona klo ma odo la kwa ba mi anovi amanya dua fanya e ko glo gba no gba la nyala ga ofa na 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 ma hogu no ho ji to na 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 ma hogu ga kana ube amamanya gba la dango aga ma le shu o to fun ra ke o tan klo ama ya o do go ma do pe ka na ba iji me ka ba no yuma or Governor Professor. I knew Musunonya, Alabano, Missionary no Kumla Huma, and no Mona Grovella away, Pla and Loga. When I got a car, who moved to? I'm a woman and a tua. Yeah, I'm a donaji guitar, a bit of Zogolo. Whereas as Ramuro, the Kakoba Mauna Grola was the correct woman of woman, but don't rather work by Yata Mukutia, a homoa, and Wachi. Your baby of a new care of you me out of Jesus Christ. Oh, none more la la, care as a crystal talk. I have a two old digital toy. I have a far, I've been a strong, a strong matin, for the show of my tongue, over the Zora Castle, with the children of Josephine. I have a mamma, I love a funny nano young woman, you are ready. I love you, who my boy, what a soon would not be ugly. I can never know that, but no less Christopher Coma. Of a zone of Puna, at a name in Kurma, my old dear, at the Japuna, a mamma bauber, Musarelli, a cup of Sokatata. Tabo with a comedia up and down to a yellow boena, Gana to call Clerk, Lola, you care. The lake of our to come and annual name. A poverty, no poor new catamau or mau gau. Tafia got to hear the Madumia. Yema Yesu Christo Glavari, the love of money is the root of all evil. Pastor Shimaka, I'm a baton, not as a shebe, Karata, I don't know, no manure, a hoshauga, Papa Yukonomiala, a lava a gata quid, Lola Gade, Banya Clolaro, the Kremba Siklama over to the shebe, Unconique at Blandi, a new ga, a kama, Hama Banyo, a Kremba Kluga, Roa, a la Kubijin or Ganya. I had to look my global Kualeo Kata, Alabonia, Lola Donia, Mau Boto, Alaba Maude, Office of Motel Lashi, a fear of office, Nagra of office, no love of office, a fear of Blair, Mauva de Cotta, a Baleka Mose, a Blair Israel Yotana, a Nagra Loco, but so Mau Bona Duco, a Canada Duco Tritor, a female no love of a sample. I had to a mother of a tower of food. No food, Kirk, Rolanian a lover on no boy, the Hamaum, a labrador, a lunch a Haji Jarrell and Yapo Haji Balam Gakafi Amagali, who are glad to get to Oji, but I cheap black bear also bore woman Yamau. Let me off your own Yamau. For my car, a cobber, a cordonia, a va, 
e ya ta le bo gbo gbo anya agbro de to mi avi o kan anya o so foto mi ade e o nye mi ade fa ko mo wa o fo yo lobo to wo ala ba ale ko o gana da ha me e bo lan ku da nchi ye fu nya ye fu gba nya re global the severity of the initiation right enhances one's appreciation for the cult alien sabe ba fi gere no ma de me na balagani kaka mi agro na bo yesu pe fu yesu pe mi ata bo ple mi wota ama ma ko ma ko yesu afi de jetani ya te ola ha mama oni ma se go mo ta ma po ma ba apa po to ple de lanu ya ba saro ko onya re ta ma agbogrom ya ta mi alen kure ale mi initiation right afi o ko re ha mama bo lan kure nchi avalia ale be ma unya agbogro bibla na nye mozo gbala na mi wo fi onu mi anya ba mi apa gbala bibla mi mi apa onu na mo la bibla mi na mi ekwe na ma sha ma ji anu nyi na re vi anya ba nu nyi a ye nye eh ga ma pa ofo la bibla ma ko a ko ga e ya ta klo la o o gbe ba vi ara han gba ba la ba mi a fi ma wo pa mi agbono no mi a vi o la fo ma aba ni mi egun do mari na nu fi ala o ni fi la mo do wa o to vlo wo de bia o e ala ba hamau na twena suku na twena hamau aba ameka manya global to na ba onu fi am global view la suku a matan nya gloga wo sore ya fa dot twin no nan mato la ba nya to ami ru ya fa suku o abale ke dr tete glena suku mo ma ke wo tanchi ya fi mi nya global view nya nya wo fi am ya ta klo la wa adole mi anji aga nyu aka ga mo nu sha nu ma o pa nya ike o ko vina mi de yi me ga le aga ma le ma o nya aka ma o nya me aga le na ko je sa ado ple ti ko ma wu ya ta ni mi tro ya ala mi alan ko re he mi re bi na la fo mo ya fa klo la wa ala o o do mi egbon ho ni lan ko re de bi o nchi de mi atro ji chia wa mi to tro go Daddy, you are welcome to Global TV. Thank you. <laughs> Please, you want to have your general impression on today's ceremony, the inaugural address? Yeah, it's quite a brilliant one. Um, I, I, I think it's a good program to uh, inaugurate uh, an award, um, an excellence award scheme for the first moderator of the Global Evangelical Church. And the program was well organized. Uh, the, the speaker also did well. Uh, he brought forth the salient points, the problems we are facing with leadership now in Ghana. Uh, and I was very much impressed about his delivery. Yes. And I, I want to find out if you have any particular memories about the first moderator being a very senior uh, clergy. Yeah, he was a, a disciplinarian. Uh, um, he's very, um, I mean, he's a man of integrity. Uh, he will not condone and connive wrongdoing. Uh, very often in those days when the crisis was in the church, uh, you always vote against, in, uh, at senior committee meetings, you vote against everything that is unbiblical and unethical. So uh, that's why uh, he was the longest serving uh, pastor on senior committee. But when the, the, the moderator uh, travel.
the moderator, the city moderator by then. Yes, yeah. So he's uh, a kind-hearted person, a very good. Uh, in fact, in 1975, I went to seminary to write my Trinity College exam, and uh, he was done in uh, taking the pre-ordination course. I had no place to pass the night, so that was my first time of meeting him. And he took good care of me throughout the night till the morning when I wrote my exam. So when I uh, completed the uh, pastoral course at Trinity College, he was very helpful to me. He would uh, invite me to his house and help me in my ministerial formation. Wow. So um, he has helped me a lot. Yeah. Finally, I want you to conclude with uh, any message mm. or advice to leaders in the country generally from every category. <clears throat> yeah, in, leadership is influence. Um, and the, many of our leaders, you know, uh, they, I, I would say most of them are disappointing, very disappointing, because... Uh, they don't influence their followers uh, positively. Uh, they just lead them like um, uh, they, 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 the people, like maybe uh, in, in, the, in, in government and in the church, we, we have a lot of flaws in leadership. Mm. Yes, they, they are not performing and uh, like uh, the speaker said in his speech, the, most of them, uh, you know, uh, leadership should be purpose-driven. And their purpose for uh, getting into leadership is uh, very parochial, uh, self-interest-seeking, and they don't, they, they don't love uh, the people they are, they are leading. Yes. They just want to line their pockets. Uh, so I think we have a problem when it comes to leadership in this country. Yes, they are not self-sacrificing. They, 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 they want what they can get, get out of leadership, not what they can offer the people, the help they can give. No? Yeah. Then at this point, I think it is fair that you give some advice to yes. the leadership. Yes, so if you are a leader, you should be a servant leader. Uh, you know, in the Christian church, that is why, you know, in the traditional religion, the leaders uh, are always in front of uh, the worshippers, you know. But in the Christian church, we are servant leaders. So we lead from the back. We lead the choir from the back. We don't lead them from the front. Mm. Yes, yeah, so we should always be servant leaders. Yeah. So a leader should always be a servant leader. He should be uh, ready to serve and not to be served. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Sure. Thanks for having me. Sure. All right.
thank you very much for agreeing to speak with us. Kindly introduce yourself to us. Uh, my name is uh, Reverend Dr. Frank Fuga. Okay. And you are? Reverend Dr. Jocelyn Fuga. We are blessed to have you. That we will want to start with you. We just want to have your general on today's inaugural address or lecture. Well, I think that is very inspiring, um, very good. At least it has uh, opened our eyes to what it means to be a good leader, especially in the church. Uh, I'm very happy because at least we have the very reverend E.K. Amenegu, who has done so well for this church. Let me ask. Uh, yes, I, I am extremely excited as well because uh, we don't honor our heroes, mm. but the fact that we have honored him today is uh, amazing. And I, I think that uh, it reminds me once again of his own life and uh, his style of leadership. Which, which was a very inclusive leadership. Okay. Uh, the very Reverend Amenyadu is the one who would always want to encourage you and push you and let you know that, yes, you can do it. Uh, I think that they have really inspired some of us. Uh, if we are here today for what we are, even in ministry, I think we owe it to, to that first crew Wow. of leaders that uh, actually encouraged us. Yes, I think that was the question I was really going to go to, to ask you if you have had or you can have any memorial of him in a personal encounter that you would wish to share on air. Yeah. No, of our personal encounters, many, 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 wow. many. He, he was our father. Oh. He was our mentor. Oh. He, he was everything to us. Uh, for Reverend Amenyedu, I think he has impacted our lives. For me, if you want me to define what humility is, humility is Amenyedu. That's, that's my definition for humility. He, he was a leader who did not impose himself on anybody. He was willing to listen to anybody. Even the least among us he was able very, very able and willing to listen. Very, very uh, uh, down to earth man. Uh, if you can, if you can have all the words, please uh, carry. Yes, let me let me say it that way. He was a team player. He said he he brought the team together, and to me, that is one of the things I always see. And is that as a leader, you're not supposed to do everything. All you have to do is make sure that people around you can do that. We encourage people to, to do their very best. I think that we pray with the Lord. We never, you know, focus any attention on himself. We always say, look at my people. I have great kings. I have great leaders. This church is really blessed with people. We have the gift. most important thing for any mentor. Somebody they can look up to and learn from him or from her. And I think that for me, apart from the moderator and many of being a spiritual father, he was our mentor as well. We, we looked up to him. He was not interested in material things. He was not looking for sex. Mm. He was not in, uh, in, in leadership to make money. Uh, I, I can tell you that he was very happy leading the church and seeing people prosper than he himself, you know, uh, getting anything out of leadership. 
for me, that is that is key. Yeah, that is key, and and that has impacted my life so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any additions? Yeah, I, I think that sums it up. Right. I mean, let young pastors look for mentors that they that they can look up to and who can teach them. I think that's it. Viewers, you have heard it all. We want to thank you so much for joining us, even as we had the inaugural address the, of the very first moderator of the Global Evangelical Church. Thank you. The, the question to ask now is who takes over from Reverend Amenyedu? I will emulate his humility, his servant leadership lifestyle, that we will also become very great leaders in future. God bless us all. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.